Hello everybody and welcome. Today I'll be talking about the Blitz up north. Now the aim of my talk today will be to try and highlight five cities in the north of England that were affected by the Blitz, aka the aerial bombing campaign of Britain during the Second World War. Now the Blitz up north is a very relevant and I think quite an important topic to cover, not least because it covers a lot of areas and histories that somewhat get forgotten about, get somewhat get forgotten about, but also because it covers a lot of cities that have quite interesting, harrowing and inspiring stories. And it'd be a shame for that history to be lost simply because it had less casualties than places down south, such as London. For example, if you were to type in Blitz into Google, one of the first non-London or northern places you'll get to, all the way down there on the seventh row in the, in the red circle talking about Hull. And that's only because Hull was also one of the most bombed cities during the Second World War. Um, now, of course, London earns its place as one of the most talked about. It was the capital city, of course, and it was the most bombed city during the Second World War, but I do believe that one of the other reasons why the North is often forgotten about and London is often pictured centre front when talking about the Blitz and sometimes erasing other histories or forgetting about other histories is because of things like propaganda. Now, this is probably a common image to a lot of you. This is, of course, the milkman doing his rounds during the Blitz. Propaganda was one of the main instruments in order to try and ensure morale wasn't lowered during the aerial bombing of Britain. Now, the you use of the word propaganda is quite specific there because this was actually staged to this photograph, and yet it persisted in a post, what has become a post-war phenomenon of looking back at the Blitz and calling it the Blitz spirit. And so I truly believe that propaganda by focusing on places in London, such as this as well, is come to embody how Britain thrived and survived despite the fact there was great loss and great fear. Now, a lot of my research is either all history or history of the media, two very interesting sources that some people often believe don't come across as accurate. However, one thing that I believe is quite important about it is it shows not only how public perception was at the time, but also how maybe the elites wanted public perception to be as well. And all history also provides that real sense of historical events. Now, the Blitz itself was comes from the word German word Blitzkrieg, and of course Blitzkrieg mean lightning war, and of course Hitler wanted to use Blitzkrieg or lightning war after learning from the mistakes of the German army during the First World War. Now, the term Blitz was coined by the media to describe the onslaught by German aircraft on Britain. However, at the time, the media actually was calling a lot of things Blitz. These were both from 1939 and 1940, for example, and one of the key things about this is that they were using the term blitz in the media in order just to describe what could be a heavy handed assault. And so when we think of the word blitz or the blitz in the sense of the aerial bombing campaign, blitz actually comes a lot from the media just using it in common everyday terms, anything from the aerial assault all the way to talking about mayors in, a, mayors in Texas. The first city we're talking about is Sheffield. And now Sheffield was bombed on the 12th and 15th of December 1940 and suffered its heaviest raid that night. And we're starting with Sheffield because we're going in chronological order. Now, Sheffield was actually bombed before this and bombed after this, specifically also in 1941. But the worst night of bombing was on the 12th and 15th of December. In total, 660 people were killed and a further 3,000 injured, with 6,000 homes affected. Now, the reason these figures are so high for what was an industrial area was because Sheffield was a mass producer of steel. In fact, for the first 18 months of the war, the one drawn power in the country could help make the crankshafts for the Spitfire engines, and that was located in Sheffield. However, on the night of the Blitz, the area over the east end of the city, which was the industrial area, was supposedly quite cloudy. And so, therefore, the Luftwaffe actually targeted the civilian areas. So Sheffield was chosen for its industrial output, as, of course, one of the purpose of the Blitz was to affect morale, but also to affect how Britain could contribute to its own war effort. 
but because it couldn't really get a clear target on a lot of the industrial areas in Sheffield, it, they then opted to attack civilian areas instead, hence why Sheffield on these two nights had such a high death count. Now, this map, which I've created and I will provide a link to as well, goes over some of the key locations or some of the more story driven or some of the more uh, important locations that were affected or ones that tell the story of the Sheffield Blitz. We'll start with Savile Street East. Savile Street East was the location of Firth Brown Steels. Now, that was the place where stainless steel was actually invented by Harry Brearley was also the location of a factory that helped produce steel for the war effort because steel was so paramount in the war effort. Uh, it was also the location of uh, the only person to ever be knighted in a factory, supposedly, as Alan Grant, who was on the knights on the honours list for that year anyway, was knighted when King George visited Sheffield in January 1941, saw that he managed to get a factory back up and running because while civilian targets were hit, so were industrial areas, and knighted him there on the spot on the factory floor. The mall was a civilian shopping centre in Sheffield, and it was completely decimated by the blitz of uh, 12th and 15th of December. Uh, the Marples Hotel, which is now just the Marples, but gets its name from the Marples Hotel, was a hotel that was... Uh, bombed and had a, suffered a direct hit and that direct hit killed 70 plus people who were hiding in the cellars of the hotel. Sheffield City Hall was also affected by some of the bombing but what's important about this one is that on the pillars outside there is actually still some shrapnel damage that you can see and so the scars of the blitz are still actually visible today. And finally Letchby Avenue in Tinsley in Sheffield is important because while Sheffield was known for its steel output, it was also a producer of coal. Now, Tinsley Park Colliery, which was located on Letchby Avenue in Tinsley, was actually one of the targets it was uh, revealed post-war of the Nats, of the Luftwaffe. And therefore, Tinsley Park Colliery is quite important because it actually shows that not only were they producing coal, which made them a potential Nazi target, but also, that they were actually producing not just steel, showing that Sheffield was a big industrial centre that deserves to be remembered. And as well, before we move on, it's also quite interesting that Rotherham, where I'm from, was also targeted for its industrial output. It made iron, it made steel, it, it produced coal. But Actually, because it was surrounded by RAF bases, such as RAF Finningley, RAF Furbeck, RAF Doncaster, more English planes landed on Rotherham than German bombs did during the Second World War. Now, what's important about the, locate, the bombing of Rotherham in relation to Sheffield, however, is that it shows that these areas were sometimes targeted for their industrial output, but a lot of the time they were targeted simply because they were close to these cities that had targets. So not only did the cities up north often get forgotten about, but the towns that surrounded them also then get forgotten about as well. And these were blitz targets and blitz victims that did suffer casualties. So these are lives lost that are simply put to the wayside, I believe, when we talk about the blitz. Now, my research mainly focuses on the media and also of oral history, as I've said, and I think one important thing about the media during the time of the Blitz was that whilst it was subject to a lot of censorship, what it did do was show us a very different side to the war. Now, of course, a lot of it was mainly focused to try and raise morale. And they, a lot of the time, they didn't really want to publish any negative story. So what you find that is when looking at the media during the Second World War, they would often tell of these stories that sometimes get lost to time, actually. For example, the evidence for this one does really come from the newspaper archive. So the importance is that these stories, while sometimes might be focusing more on the positive side, while there might be a negative issue, do actually at least preserve stories for that give us a more of an insight into what life was like or what they wanted people to perceive the war as during the time. OK, now I'm going to play you a clip from a Sheffield Blitz survivor. Uh, one night, when they had a blitz, there were two bombs fell. 
One was a landmine, what they used to call parachute mines, and one was a time bomb. And the time bomb landed at a petrol station, British petrol station on Surrey Road, right? And the one, the landmine, landed only 50 yards away from our shelter on Col Colford Road, right? And they were unexploded, but all the people got evacuated to Donald Board School, which wasn't a school then, it was an ARP shelter on the up Main Road, you know, down near Salvation Army. Yeah. And uh, so we all got evacuated to there. Now then, like remember, only about seven or eight at the time, uh, uh, old man Bridges, he got some navvies to dig down and um, the uh, bomb disposal unit managed to, you know, stop that time bomb going up because it was right near petrol, petrol tanks. And when I went down, and well, the kids we went down, there were bottles, empty bottles, beer bottles, where he, he got beer down them and, and, it, did, and it, it, it hit roof and deflected and went somewhere like about 10 foot down it ground, this. And they worked all through night and dug it out. Now then, the land mile, which landed another 50 yards from our house, on another, another way, <laughs> they, had to, they had to detonate that, well, this particular time, it surely not stone it. I was a young kid, I went to the toilet outside, which you had to then, you know. Sat there, and suddenly an almighty, whoom, and he lifted me off at sea. You know, when they detonated that one. Uh. My mum worked at Mokley Arrowhead factory. My father was in the army, got called up, was in the army. So in 1940, they were bombing Sheffield. So my grandma got us out of bed come on, some nasty men are going to come in, they might drop bombs on the house. Well, I said, I was only young, in 1940, so off I went. And the air raid shelters was on Maltby Crags, the air raid shelter that was built, they'd just finished building them. I went in there, and as we were walking up, we could see all the searchlights, and Sheffield were glowing, because they dropped all incendiary bombs. And it was glowing, and, well, we were in the air raid shelter for a while until a man came in and said, you know, it's all clear, so we could go home. But that happened on oh, many, maybe on three or four occasions when they bombed Sheffield. They were after bombing steel piece and tozers because at that time it was the biggest steelworks in Great Britain. And there were seven chimneys and they called them the Seven Sisters. Next city that we're going to talk about, moving chronologically, is Manchester. And as you can tell by the dates, the worst nights of bombing for Manchester oh, give this its title, its form of the Christmas Blitz. And what's really tragic, I think, about the Christmas Blitz of Manchester is that Liverpool was currently being really bombed, had been really, suffered really badly with bombing. And so a lot of the fires actually caused a lot of extensive damage that couldn't really be put out as firefighters were busy elsewhere. As you can see here, firefighters were having to deal with extensive fire damage as one of the tactics of the Luftwaffe was to drop incendiary bombs and flares that would deal multiple purposes. It would be to deal, obviously, fire damage that could then spread and weaken structures, but also to highlight where areas were and also to pave the way so that way uh, Luftwaffe could see what they were doing as blackouts, of course. Not total blackouts for certain areas, but blackouts, of course, would try and hide structures from German bombing. Now, 660 people died in the Sheffield Blitz, and as you can see in these two, in these nights here, 684 died, so very similar, very tragically high uh, loss of life over these nights. 2,000 were injured with 467 tons of explosives, so quite a high amount of explosives, and quite a high amount of incendiary bombs, 1,925, which led to around 400 sites ablaze across the city. Now, what's important, like I was saying about that, is that Manchester lost a lot of its homes and a lot of its, um, a lot of its shelter during the, the Christmas Blitz, and that meant that a lot of people did actually spend Christmas and Christmas dinner either on the streets or with other people or having to share places or in desecrated air, desecrated homes. And I think that was what a, tr a struck tragedy with a lot of people when talking about the Manchester Blitz, the fact that it uh, ruined Christmas for a lot of them. 
Again, some of the key locations here in the Manchester Blitz. Uh, you have Albert Square, where was the first bomb dropped. Uh, Hull Street as well. Um, there was Erskine Street as well, which was where there was a shelter that was meant to only hold 200 people, but actually saw over 400 go into there. Uh, Manchester Royal Infirmary was one of the sites where nurses went in and bravely helped put out some fires in the men's ward. And then the Old Trafford, which actually occurred in March 1941, after the Christmas Blitz. Now, Trafford Park was a site of heavy industry, making Manchester one of the key targets because it was a massive industrial output. And situated there, of course, is Old Trafford football stadium and that just shows that one of the other side effects of being an industrial center not only were you a target for your blitz but also for for uh, aerial assault but also that you would suffer cultural losses as well as old Trafford football stadium was actually put out of action until 1949 and i think that's one of the other key things about the blitz that people suffered not just in terms of losing loved ones or losing physical items or property but also they lost things that they would do in their day-to-day -day lives as well and this is key as well for when studying the blitz specifically through the lens of the media you would see that they actually referred to them as the blitz as well showing that they were recognizing this as part of a aerial bombing campaign and were using it as part of hitler's tactic of blitzkrieg Leeds was bombed on the 14th and 15th of March, and Leeds is in West Yorkshire. Now, what's striking about West Yorkshire is, whilst it suffered a lot, and of course we can't erase, or we shouldn't erase, a lot of the loss of life and cultural damage that the Blitz had on West Yorkshire, there is no shying away from the fact that West Yorkshire, comparatively, didn't suffer as badly as south north or especially east yorkshire and the humberside and the east riding of yorkshire now a lot of this is owing to geographical purposes from a more pragmatic standpoint east yorkshire was further away from germany than the others were equally a lot of the time they had a lot of rain or cloud over there so they couldn't really hit the targets well and also leeds was quite inland quite in the pennines as well so actually, it was quite hard to hit it. Now, Leeds helped produce the, um, some of the Lancaster bombers, and it was also quite uh, important for engineering as well. So it did contribute quite heavily towards the war effort, hence why it was one of the targets. But comparatively, compared to, uh, to the previous blitz we just looked at, the nights of the 14th and the 15th of March 1941 had much lower body counts. 65 people were killed, and of course, that's a tragic loss of life. But... The last one is how it got its nickname. The Lehrig had 25 tons of explosives dropped, which earned it the title the Quarter Blitz. Technically speaking, if it had no le if it had no more than 99 tons, if it had less than 100 tons, it didn't constitute as a blitz. But the 14th and 15th of March 1941 was some of the worst nights of bombing for Leeds during the Second World War. Uh, Bradford as well was bombed on the 31st of August 1940 and even though um, 100 bombs were dropped on it there was only one fatality but what is important with Bradford and with Leeds for example is that it was the cultural losses the cultural damage that meant a lot Leeds Museum Leeds Town uh, Leeds Hall was also affected uh, Bradford lost one of its oldest shops for example Huddersfield was also affected and a lot of these were targeted because of their industrial outputs, but frankly, it was the culture side that actually was impact. We can see that five of the key locations chosen for Leeds was Marsh Lane, for example, where on the 1st and 2nd of September 1940, Leeds suffered a major bombing campaign, which is actually before the Blitz campaign started in the 7th of September 1940. Leeds Town Hall, again, on the night of the 14th and 15th of March, suffered a major raid, and it was one of the cultural sites that was impacted. And as well, Park Row, where the museum used to be, suffered a lot of cultural losses when the uh, Egyptology, some of the animal sections were completely uh, damaged. 
Leeds Bradford Airport, which today now sits further up, was uh, affected because it was used to be RAF Yeadon, and it was also a place where they produced the Avro Lancaster bomber. And one of the key parts about that is it shows why Leeds was so important to the war effort, but also why that made it therefore a target. And of course, where it says Leeds on the map actually means Leeds train station, because in 1943, Leeds held what was called a Wings for Victory campaign, and a lot of other cities did as well. And it was about raising money in order to buy aeroplanes for the RAF. One other key element of the media during the Blitz was, as mentioned, about showing off Alan Grant, who, of course, was knighted in the Sheffield factory, is that they tended to focus on positive stories and on stories of bravery rather than focusing on ones of tragedy or rather than focusing on ones that were on just listing where places were bombed. And what's, I think, important here is it also opens up using the media why or what happened to these places when they were bombed, because a lot of this might have been lost or not be in other sources. But I think the real takeaway here is that the media at the time was used for not just for propaganda, but also as a genuine way of showcasing important and brave people and also for trying to raise morale. Now Newcastle, which is one of the th which is the farthest north furthest northern city we go to, was quite extensively bombed throughout the war. Now the twenty fifth of April, nineteen forty one, was not one of the actually the heaviest nights of bombing for Newcastle. But what made the twenty fifth of April important was that it was the one during that time of the Blitz period from the seventh of September, nineteen forty, until the eleventh of May, nineteen forty one. Now. On that night, 47 people were killed and 70 injured. Uh, but in one of the worst raids that was to happen later on in 1941, you'd see much more than that killed. And throughout the war, 141 people were killed. And surrounding areas such as Jarrow and South Shields were hit as well, which again highlights that location and in an output made them a target, but also just being around these industrial areas also made them quite made them a target as well by proxy which to me just shows that we should make an extended effort to remember these places because they lost a lot of lives and were hit, hit by german bombers simply because they just happened to be near a major city the newcastle blitz you have the st Thomas road which was one of the first uh, places bombed walker which was one of the industrial areas now heaton cemetery the heaton cemetery there was a mass grave dedicated to the unmarked bodies of those who died on the 25th of April 1941. New Bridge Street was a later date of when Newcastle was bombed as well. Finally, Holderness Road as well. You'll um, see that there were some, in, some choice locations here that saw bombing throughout the war. And I think that speaks to the fact that not only when we talk about the Blitz, do we not just talk about London, we also don't just talk about September 24th, 1940 until May 41. We talk about actually bombing happened all the time through the war and it was also happened everywhere through the war. Now, one also another important part about the Blitz in the media was that actually they would talk uh, they were a lot of them were sort of condemned to silence or sworn to silence either by law or by choice and they wouldn't actually really re uh, report all too entirely on the specific locations what they did report was the high, uh, german high command uh, communique or the wehrmacht wehrmacht Bericht, or the uh, wehrmacht communique and that was a arm of the german propaganda machine and what that would say is that these areas were low, these areas were bombed in England and it would announce that to the world in order to say look we're bombing your areas and a lot of the time British media would say that the Germans claimed it so that way they weren't actually admitting to the Germans that they did it that they actually hit them but were reporting on the places actually hit and so the importance of this really to study in the Blitz is that it shows that actually they could report accurately, accurately in some areas, but it mainly had to be by kind of admitting it or saying that the Germans claimed it in order to do so. 
Now, of course, we come to one of the most bombed cities throughout the war, Hull. Now, 7th, 8th and 9th of May were some of the heaviest times of bombing throughout the war, but by no means were they the heaviest by a long stretch. There were other locate, there were other times in 1941 as well when you saw 90 people, 140 people killed. In fact, throughout the war, Hull had an awful body count with 1,200 people estimated killed. 90 to 95% of its buildings were damaged and 152,000 people were left homeless, which was nearly half the population of Hull at the time. Hull was so heavily hit for specific reasons, it was strategically important to uh, England and thus had to be attacked by the Luftwaffe because it made it such a valuable target. It was great for shipbuilding, it was a port city, it also had engineering and industrial output as well, so it made it a key target that needed to be taken out if it was to if the Luftwaffe was to cripple Britain's war effort. But also, its genuine location, like Newcastle, of being in the northeast, just made it in close proximity, made it one of the closest proximity areas for Germany just to come over. And the Humber estuary, which runs through Hull was often used as a waypoint or a waypoint for Luftwaffe pilots just to lock onto and come down there just so they knew where they were going. In this night alone, 420 people were killed. And whilst that's actually less than some of the nights of the Sheffield or the uh, Manchester Blitz, you've got to remember that actually this was just one of the events. 1,200 people throughout the war were killed in, uh, in Hull. So in this one night, responding for about a third of that, it's actually quite a considerable night. And also, this is one of the this was close to when the strategic aerial bombing campaign that lasted until the 11th of May ended. But you saw that Hull was bombed from 1940 up until 1945. So here we have five key locations that but we frankly could look at quite a vast amount of, especially civilian areas within Hull. Now, Chamberlain Street was the site of the first ever air raid on Hull, the first known air raid on Hull, and also one of the first ever air raids on Britain. On the 20th of June at 1.40 a.m., Chamberlain Street was hit by an incendiary attack. And even though there were no fatalities, what it did to the, psych to the psyche of the Hull and to the wider implications of Britain was that it ended this idea of a phony war for Britain, the idea that the war wasn't affecting or coming to Britain, it was all the way over there. Um, Paul Home was actually a location near, is actually a location near the outstray on the Humber and because the hum because the docks, such as the Victoria docks, the Alexandra docks, the King George docks, were so important, not just to Hull, but also to the greater war effort, there was a campaign started in January 1940 to make decoys of these docks, whereby they would be placed near these docks, and therefore German bombers who would come down the Humber would think that these were the real ones and would attack those instead. And then because they think they've attacked the docks, they would then leave the real ones unaffected. Albion Street and Danson Lane were civilian areas that were attacked during different nights of the Blitz as well. And finally, Boys was where the old Savoy Cinema used to be. And on the 17th of March, 1945, so yes, not long before BE Day, there was a Heinkel 111 bomber that attacked people coming out of this cinema and it landed in the death of immediately 12 people, and then finally a 13th victim four days later. And it just shows that actually throughout the war, nowhere was safe as well, let alone within this time capsule of the September 1940 to May 1941. And it also shows that Hull was so easy to target that even just one bomber managed to get through towards the end of the war and I think that's also a final important lesson of that one, is that it didn't take a full squadron in order to deal a lot of damage during the war. One Heinkel 111 bomber managed to kill 13 people, not months before the end of the war. And I think that's the true tragedy of Hull, that the Blitz, not, the Hull Blitz not only killed a vast amount of people during the war, but also that it did it throughout the, throughout the war, and these raids are often forgotten about. And finally, one of the most characteristic parts of studying the Hall Blitz 
is that the media actually recognised the importance and the government recognised the importance of keeping Hull's anonymity as a city because if they told, if they announced to the world that yes, Germany was affecting it, not only would it affect public morale, also these locations would then be more accurately targeted. So they would actually refer to it as a northeast town or a northern coastal town. And that's also not only one of the reasons why I think the whole blitz or the blitz up north gets forgotten about, because actually this effect of not talking about it bled over where they were saying, oh, actually, no, we, we don't talk about it. But also the sources are really there. In the newspaper archive, for example, lists these as northeastern town. This was after a raid that happened in the early hours of the February 4th, 24th, 1941. But these northeastern town, if I say northeastern town, historians and researchers can't really pinpoint it down unless they corroborate it like we have with other sources. And so therefore these these memories, the, these cities are being lost and forgotten about because frankly, the sources don't actually tell us what they were go what was going on. But it's important to study the media at this rate because in this way during the war, because it actually shows us that they're not only were these cities important, but also that the media kind of had it hand tied by law, but also by its devotion by its devotion to the war effort. And I think that's why studying the media, the blitz is so important. It explains a lot about how they wanted the public to perceive the war, but also it explains a lot about how we remember the war. I, I lived on West Parade, and um, one night we were in the air raid shelter, and uh, a bomb dropped at the top of West Parade, at the bottom of West Parade, near the, uh, the near the school, Thomas Stratton School. And I nipped out the air raid shelter to have a look, which was much to my mother's upset. And uh, there was a blaze. So I went back in and told all the kids in the air raid shelter that the school was going up. So everybody was really happy, you know, full of joy. And the following morning we went out and uh, there was the school. We're still standing there bravely. And the Germans had hit a, a much less strategic target, a wood yard next door. So we, we were back at school again. We had relatives who lived in, uh, in East Hull. And we, well, Garden Village was in East Hull, so we had lived there. Now we we're in North Hull. But you, you could have got round the edge, except there was no lights. <coughs> uh, there was no street lights there. And the, uh, the roads were more or less country roads around the Sutton area. And so we used to go into town and out again. So yes, we saw damage. And um, what was it like, the damage in there? What Just was piles of rubble, really. Um, they moved it very slowly. It was moved. It was piled up down Priory Road. And in fact, now, it's a hill which very few people know just what it is, but it's a grass-covered mound of rubble from the city of Hull. And so that rubble would have been cleared from the streets yes, under there? Yes, it, it was cleared from the streets. Not, from, not so much from the sites, the bomb sites, but from the streets, because you needed access. And where is that mound again, sorry? It's off Priory Road. It's on Priory Road. Yes. Mm. We lived uh, the block of houses between, I was at one end of a block of houses, the other end was the chapel, uh, big building. And if I went out the back on the night of the Blitz, I remember going out, and I'll never ever forget this, that building, big grey building, was blood red absolutely red with the reflection of the fires from Hull. It was it was absolutely amazing. They were concentrating the bombing on in Hull. Uh, bomb, trying to bomb the docks and all like that. And as I say, I remember, I said I had to have it in hat on. I was out, I don't know if it was that particular night, but I was out one night with my dad and we were watching things and all of a sudden there was an almighty ban and uh, we went and had a look and a piece of shrapnel had come down and hit the dustbin lid and punched a hole in the dustbin lid and he said now and that's why you wear your tin helmet <laughs> we lived in a very small house and a bomb hits 
few houses around direct. We were, you know, in those days, parents thought that the big solid oak table you could, and we always went under that when the sirens went. And everything was destroyed except that table. We were saved. And so we, we were all shipped off to my um, grandmother's, who had an aunt living there. And another daughter also bombed out with three children. We had fun and laugh, six in a bed and <laughs> all this. And uh, we, we gradually got back on our feet, but we, we came out of bombing with nothing. As a, as a child, we were never scared. We didn't, I mean, the fact that we were pulled out of bed and a blanket round us and went to next door's uh, garage that, with other people there, it was all fun to us. And of course my dad was away in the army. Um, we saw my dad once in four years and my mum got pregnant with another one of us. And um, yeah, it's, as, as children you don't realise the seriousness of it. Finally, we're going to listen to one other whole bit survivor who talks a bit about his experience, but also does speak to this notion of, well, actually, why have some northern areas been forgotten about? Now, of course, this does not mean we have to then take focus away or disregard some of the more known about bombings and the people who lost their lives in it. There's still plenty of research to be done about that. But it is an important thing to say, well, actually, questioning why the narrative of the Blitz often negates quite a lot of northern cities. Not on our shelter, on Mr Tennyson's shelter, next door but one that way, you could see, because they had concrete over these steel things as well. And you could see the bullet holes where a, a German plane had, you know, machine gunned it. South Courts Lane, Holness Road, they got heavily bombed. And my Aunt Lily, they got so fed up of it, they came to us, Elliburn Avenue. And they stayed a couple of nights. Well, then, I mean, your back kitchen, and then there was like a back, a, a closed bit, like a, an alcove with a door. And we used to put my brother's push bike across. Well, when the sirens went, you would have to take the bloody bike out, unlock the bloody door. And my Aunt Lily said, I'd rather go back home and be bloody bombed than trying to get out of here to the to the shelter. Say, London and Coventry. Coventry was a one night bloody rain, but it got the cathedral. We was the most heavily bombed city outside of London. And in Northern Cemetery, there is a mass grave. There's two mass graves, one for the the tower people and one for the, the people who were bombed and killed and nobody knew all the way. And they're both in Northern Cemetery. Two mass graves. Finally, moving forward. Now, as, as of course, one of the things that I think is important about learning about the North during the Blitz is that it shows that it was not just confined to the traditional 1940 to 1941 timescale, it happened across the country. And I think one linear way of looking at that in order to try and include as many places as possible would probably to focus maybe more on dates rather than just on locations as well. But on that note, it's also, I think, quite important because the purpose is not just to focus on the North or on Yorkshire, it's also to focus on other locations and other blitzes. So for example, the Baedeker Blitz of 1942, and there were other locations that, frankly, people don't associate with the Blitz. So York, the 19, 29th of April 1942 raid and the Baedeker Blitz. But also, you had places like the uh, like Glasgow, Aberdeen. The Isle of Wight was also targeted during the Second World War. Now, I've also featured heavily all history interviews with survivors of the Blitz. And I think that's because not only does it uncover stories that may not be there, and also it gives the Blitz a real personal sense but also it really just shows that this that how people remember the blitz is also just as important as preserving that stories and information as well and 
with this kind of morbid, we're hitting a generational cliff edge where a lot of the people who remembered the Blitz were children at the time, and even a lot of those are now passing away, sadly. So I think the All History Archive is not only great for providing a different insight into how we studied the Blitz and also for researchers of the Blitz to find out more stuff, but also it's our duty to try and preserve those memories. And finally, as a filmmaker, one thing that I think is paramount is to try and do this in an engaging way to say actually there is a way of getting future generations to try and engage with the past. And I'm a big believer that filmmaking, documentaries, are, engaged, are a fantastic way of doing that because it's a forgotten art form. You have sound, you have uh, visual effects, you have different camera effects, you can have a presenter, for example. And I want to do a documentary about the blitz up north but also some of these more forgotten about blitzes but thank you very much for coming to my talk and i will also be putting the link to the blitz up north map uh, in the description below and if you do feel free to do feel free to check it out and if you do have any questions please shoot me an email i'll put my email down in there in the description as well but if not thank you very much for listening and remember the blitz happened all over the country pretty much all the time and I think it's important as historians but also as history enthusiasts to try and preserve those memories.